Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 248, right? Dos, cuatro, ocho. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are doing fine, right? Hope you guys are doing fine this lovely Wednesday, sunny morning. It's now sometime just before 8 a.m. I'm getting prepped. I'm getting ready. Record this podcast and then whoo, zip off. But hope you guys are doing well beforehand. Hope you guys are having a nice day. Um, for those of you that are worried about the week and are looking forward to a Friday, you've only got a couple more days to go. So just hang on tight. You know, um, for those of you who are um, broke as fuck and don't have any money and wait until payday in a couple of weeks, hold on to your belts. Don't buy that salmon from pret a manger If anything, go and, you know, buy a packet of crisp or a pack of biscuits somewhere from Tesco Express and have that for lunch and hide that in your pocket and then slowly but surely nick a couple of biscuits out from the top and, you know, sip on some free water in your office because you don't want anyone to know that you're broke. Do that before you spend four forty nine that you don't have on a sandwich in prep, and then you decide to eat in, and they give you a silver tray for an extra two quid. Don't do that to yourself, all right? Don't do that. Hold on tight. Hold on tight. Um, hope you guys are well, man. I'm doing quite well, as you can tell. I'm ready. I'm hyped. I'm ready to go. I've got a workout in. I've had some nice keto breakfast, loads of sausages, loads of eggs, loads of bacon, a couple of bits of avocado, coffee, water that I still have here that I'm about to finish. Just one whole bottle I've kind of suddenly been able to gulp down just this morning. So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling hype. As you can tell, I'm hype as fuck. Um, but yeah, hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are good. Um, I'm amazing. Um, the week has gone by pretty quickly, hasn't it? Um, for me this time around, maybe it has to do a lot with my focus. Maybe it has a lot to do with the fact that it's quite nice out there. It's a bit chilly, but it is quite sunny and stuff. That makes it a little bit more enjoyable and stuff. So you know what I mean. And generally, it just feels like a nice time of the year. You know, things are slowing down a little bit in the office. It's November. People don't really want to do too much. By the time Christmas comes around, the office closes. People are swanning off to go see their family right which people always fucking use as an excuse in the office is i'm gonna go see my family you're not gonna go see anyone you just want to go home and watch netflix and scratch your nuts we all want to do the same thing um so the whole family thing doesn't make any sense but hey everyone's got their prerogatives so everything is winding down and everything is running a bit slower but also it gives you time to catch up on some stuff you know tie up some loose ends maybe arrange a couple of meetings maybe you know connect with some people you haven't connected with in a long time at your workplace or maybe discover a new luncheon spot something do something during this wind down period but i hope you guys are good hope you guys are well um What's been going on with me? Not much. I went. On my, oh, I went on another three mile run yesterday. I went on like, you know, basically I did a five k yesterday. I'm going to do another one today, and um, yeah, I'm getting my endurance is improving. I'm starting to hack the idea of running every single day is becoming a little bit more normal to me now. Um, I'm big, my tolerance or my adaptability to running every day has increased. So has my overall endurance, which helps. <coughs> And now I just need to make sure, number one, I lose the weight so I can, you know, run quicker. And number two, I just increase my pace. Um, obviously, they're both interwined, they're both interlinked. I think, you know, the more, less weight you have to carry, the easier it is to run quicker. But I'm just trying to make them come at the same level. And obviously, you know, eating clean the way I have done in the last couple of weeks is obviously going to help me shed the pounds. So that shouldn't be a bit of an issue. And so far, so good, man. So far, so good. I'm, I'm actually following, do you remember the, there's something I did, in the, there's something I did when I was um, about to run the, Barcelona half marathon actually I prescribe to the Tim Ferriss uh, plan that he has on his website let me quickly check it out for you right so it's lose there we go let's have it here so it's a Tim Ferriss has this um he's got an actual book actually the four hour chef which I have somewhere actually I have a, I have a bookshelf over there but Tim Ferriss as you guys are aware of you know the legendary um we don't call him tech tech entrepreneur but we just say a person that actually he's the one that actually introduced me to the startup world my first introduction to startups was through tim ferris i read the four hour work week and obviously that changes your whole perspective on um how you should judge your time um how you should yeah how you value your time the idea of location um independent working um just you know all that good stuff that you would never really thought about until kind of tim ferris kind of sparked that that um lit that kind of fuse or switch that switch on or light that bulb, whatever it may be called. And um that, that was the first book I kind of got introduced with the whole startup world. And again, um, you know, having a muse, creating an in the creating basically a self sufficient business. I actually got introduced to Facebook. No, I introduced to Amazon FBA. So if I feel by Amazon businesses, I did it through there. When I first started importing um hair sponges, 
that are selling uh, door to door to different barbershops from China. That was specifically from um, Tim Ferriss. That was a great little business I had as well for a while, but I had to stop it because, you know, the industry or the market got flooded. But yeah, I'm a big fan of Tim Ferriss. I'm a big, big fan of him. I love everything that he does. And, and he's got this really um, easy um, to understand and follow plan in order to lose 20 pounds in 30 days. And that's what I did, I think, when I before I ran the bus on the half marathon and it worked perfectly. So if you're out there and you want to lose some weight, but you just want to do it in a really healthy and clear way, I recommend you check this out. It's an article Tim Ferriss put up on his website. I'll quickly read it out for you if you guys are interested. How to lose 20 pounds in 30 days uh, without doing an exercise, right? So it's the following. Oh, that's obviously the most important bit. Obviously, I'm exercising a lot, so that kind of puts me in the, you know, in the kind of freak category because I think most people tend to prefer not to work out and just lose weight just through like diet alone which is going to be a lot which which will take longer to do right this obviously maybe it depends how you want to do it if you don't like exercise then obviously you know making sure you eat right and eat clean will eventually allow you the weight to kind of completely you know fall off from you especially if you're kind of substituting the odd bus ride here and there for a couple of walks that might help as well just to kind of you know generally keep you fit i know stephen fry got fit from walking a lot didn't he right stephen fry was really big at one time and then he got really skinny and i think a lot of it came from him just walking around the, you know walking around england and being in his natural curious self but yeah this this article says the following um it is possible to lose 20 pounds of body fat in 30 days by optimizing any of these three factors exercise diet or drugs and supplement regimen i've seen the elite um, implementation of all free working in professional athletes in this post we'll explore what i refer to as the slow carb diet in the next uh, in the last six weeks i've cut from 180 pounds to 165 while adding about 10 pounds of muscle which means i've lost about 25 pounds of fat there is only the, uh, this is the only diet um besides the rather extreme uh, cyclical ketogenic diet the c kd that's produced uh, veins across my abdomen which is the last place i lost fat on damn you scandinavian genetics here are the four simple rules i followed rule number one avoid white carbohydrates avoid any carbohydrates that all can be white um, follow foods uh, the following foods are thus prohibited except within a one and a half hour uh finishing resistance training workout um of at least 20 minutes in length so you have to avoid bread rice cereal potatoes pasta fried food um, with breading if you avoid eating anything white you'll be safe number two eat the same few meals over and over again the most successful dieters regardless of whether their goal is to muscle gain or fat loss eat the same few meals over and over again and of course i found that quite easy i think especially since i've been doing the intermittent fasting with my, my app zero it's really helped to kind of maybe mm, streamline things a little bit i don't i'm not necessarily um I'm not necessarily always, how, how did you say streamline? Yeah, something to just streamline things. I don't need to always think about what I'm going to eat. I have the same sort of meals. I know exactly what my schedule is in terms of eating plan. I have a particular window to eat, a particular window to fast. It just makes life a little bit more easier for me. And plus, especially because I tend to eat my lunch quite late. I tend to go for lunch about 2 p.m. or some shit. So by the time I leave to go to lunch at 2 p.m., 2.30, if it's got a late meeting, I can then, you know, really stretch my eating window a bit, a bit further, you know, a bit more wider, or whatever maybe, and then I can probably eat uh, towards the last half an hour of my lunch, and then kind of start my um, fasting from there. So then, when I wake up at six a.m. or when I come out from the gym, um, at, you know, just after six a.m. or whatever maybe, or just you know, maybe past half six, whatever it may be, I didn't have time to just straight away um, break my fast and continue on my day. Um, that's rule two so rule one avoid white carbohydrates rule two eat the same two meals i mean eat the same few meals over and over again and he listed some options here he's got protein he's got listed down egg whites with uh, one whole egg uh for flavor he's got chicken breast or fry grass-fed organic beef and pork um for legumes he's got underneath that he's got lentils black beans and pinto beans and vegetables he's got spinach asparagus peas and mixed vegetables so um the following he says um eat as much as you uh, as you like of the follow of the above food just remember to keep it simple pick two or three meals and repeat them almost all restaurants can give you a salad or vegetables in place of french fries and potatoes surprisingly i found mexican food soaping up the rice for vegetables to be one of the cuisine the most productive is a slow carb diet most people go on low carb diets complain of low energy and quit not because such diets don't work but because they consume inefficient calories so half a cup of rice is 300 calories whereas half a cup of spinach is 15 vegetables are not calorically dense so it's critical that you add legumes for your caloric load um so yeah so basically eat those meals six what's that six times or four or four times a day i think four times per day meals and then the next couple of rules are don't drink calories which obviously means you know any sweet and you know fizzy pop all those kind of stuff avoid it rule four is take one day off a week 
as a cheat day. And so far, I've been doing, I've been kind of following that plan, and it's worked pretty well, to be honest. I've not really had any um, ill effects. I feel quite sprightly, as you can tell. I'm full of energy. I'm ready to go. Um, and yeah, I, I really, I really enjoyed it. I got, I got to be honest. It makes life more easier. I have a particular plan in place in terms of my running and my training. And again, it's just, you know, the focus is back, baby. The focus is back. That's what I, and that's what I wanted, actually, in the beginning. I wanted the focus to be back. I wanted to be back on this kind of wave. I didn't want to be, you know, how I was previously, you know, just kind of going off the loose end, or go, flying off the seat of my pants. Now I'm back to where I was in the beginning, you know. Focused, training, got my head screwed on and know where I'm going, you know. Straight, all the way forward, all the way up, all the way up, all the way up. Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on to some topics because why not? And, you know, don't have a lot of time to waste. So, um, number one, right? Um, This is a bit of an LOL. I saw this on Twitter and I thought, what the fucking fuck? This has got to hurt. <laughs> um, I'm sure some of you guys have seen it too. It's, it's been doing the rounds. Essentially, I'll describe it to you people who are listening via the podcast app. It's a bodybuilder known as Mike O'Hearn. I'm pretty sure it's pretty famous because if you hover over his name, he has 80,000 followers. So I'm pretty sure he's very well known in the industry. He's got a blue check mark. So I'm pretty sure people are well aware of him. It's some sort of, you know, convention for bodybuilders, whatever it may be. And he's essentially on stage, you know, taking off his top, revealing his, you know, chiseled physique that he spent years honing in the gym. And um, he decides to walk across the stage for some reason. I'm not sure if he's walking across the stage to get a better angle or to make sure he's in the right lighting so people can see his abdominals and his pectorials and his triceps and biceps. But whatever happens, he takes a bit of a stumble right, off yourself, the stage. It is insane how hard he falls. And you have to imagine too, right? Um, I've always said <laughs> my most favorite thing to watch on the internet our video I, no one really there's not there's not really a, a, a reddit of this actually there's not really a subreddit i can find at the moment if anyone else can find it let me know but there's not really a subreddit of like girls falling over but i love watching videos of girls falling over because naturally or well, normally in norm, in most of, in most occasions when girls fall over they don't brace themselves as they fall to the ground i'm not sure if it's because girls are not really used to rough and tumble play as much as boys are um they don't really have that kind of you know inbuilt train inbuilt kind of you know um uh reflex to just cover your face or to brace or to kind of protect your back or to protect your vital organs when you're falling over because you know as for the most part even if you're even if you're not the most sporty or of athletic dudes you've fallen over a couple of times or maybe more than a couple of times so you know what the impact feels like so you try to avoid certain things um so when you do see a guy fall over it's usually you know because of lack of awareness understanding of where they are spatially right but when they do fall over just the mass of a guy's body right the, just the weight of it, like falling down, gravity it's, gra- gravity having its way is just brutal to hear. Especially a dude like this who's like, you know, he's dense, right? He's got an absolute back off on him, right? Just whacked off, do you know what I mean? Like he's got pecs like tits, his arms look like my head. Do you know what I mean? He's huge. And the way he falls off of this, ages <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God, this guy died. Oh my days! Jesus Christ! He, he, he slaps everyone on stage, and he walks across it. But fucking hell! Mama mia, man! That was a four and a half. Oh my god! But yeah, man. Um, it's also a bit of a dorky thing to go watch a flipping um bodybuilding concert, isn't it? Right? If you're not a bodybuilder yourself, just to go watch it as a thing. That's some dog level shit, isn't it? Like, I can't imagine that. But hey, you know, what 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 do I know about imagining stuff? But yeah, that was an absolute tumble and a half, man. We had to replay that because oh my days! All right, pretty boy himself, Mike O'Hearn. Hey, is that his nickname? Pretty boy, Mike Mike O'Hearn, pretty boy, Mike, Mike pretty boy O'Hearn. That is madness, pretty boy, pretty boy. O'Hearn. <laughs> He's got that. He's got that gym. We know that gym walk when the guys are about to go over to the. Because there's a few guys. Everyone, most people in my gym have that gym walk, and I've recognised that there's a walk. There's a gym walk, and there's a, obviously there's a yeah. There's a normal gym walk, and there's also a CrossFit walk too. CrossFitters have that particular walk that they do, where they kind of you know they have their they sort of like put their they pop, they're sort of like um how do you say they kind of push their shoulders back, their chest is pointed upwards, and they kind of 
pop their bum out and sort of walk like that, right? And then gym guys have have the walk that he has, Michael Hearn, where you kind of like walk up to it, like you know, like more so like a rude boy. Do you know what I mean? Like you better lean forward and you kind of go your arms to the side so people can see what you're fucking working with. And usually that's the kind of walk that guys do when they're about to approach the dumbbell rack or something, right? They're about to lift up the fucking sixty kg fucking dumbbells, sit on the sit on a bench somewhere and just fucking push that shit up and down yes, yes, yes. that's what it sort of looks like look at him look at him you know, he's about to get, I'm about to go grab that 60, you know? I'm just grabbing the 15 kg and I'm I'm, I'm curling it. Because, oh, it's just too heavy. And he's walking across like, get out of the way, bitch. I'm on that 60 kg. And ba boom! <laughs> oh my God. Honestly, you got to watch it. I'm going to link it in the show notes for you guys watching, being, watching or listening via the podcast app. I'll link it in the show notes for you because that is honestly one of the most hilarious things I've seen in my life. That image of him, the silhouette of him falling is probably... Something that needs to be made into like um you know the NBA sign of the guy jumping in the air? That should be the sign for bodybuilding. Him falling. Like, look. <laughs> Jesus take the world. Luckily it's not super high and it's like um it's like one of those I don't know, it's a regular conference room with carpet floors, so the, the you know, the stage isn't that high. Maybe they don't use the stage too often, the stage they have to kind of bring in. If this was like in an arena somewhere and the stage is like high up above and you've got all cables and you know barricades on the floor, he would have fucked himself up properly. But the problem you mostly got is a couple cu- couple of carpet burns, so you know, don't feel too bad for him. Plus he's wham. Do you know what I mean? The whole point of having muscles is that so you can survive stuff like this, right? Why work out in the gym if your muscles don't act as like a you know inbuilt body bag? There's no point, right? You might just be skinny. Didn't didn't a certain bodybuilder recently actually? I remember somebody on the timeline. I forgot who it was. Wasn't there a particular bodybuilder? I'm gonna say it was a black dude who got stabbed and he survived because this doctor say he survived because of his muscle dens- dens- density was able to kind of absorb a lot of the a lot of the blade so it didn't hit a vital organ, which makes complete sense isn't it? logically, right? If you've got if you've got a fucking chest that pops out at like five centimeters height in from the in between of your chest and someone puts a blade in you it might help to it just go through the entire peck obviously it might hurt you know it, obviously it's gonna hurt because that's fucking muscle but jesus christ man it's got those inbuilt body bags the inbuilt sorry um, airbags inside of it <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> Okay, I'll link in the show notes. I'll link in the show notes if you guys check it out. But yeah, it's fucking hilarious, man. Oh my god, one of the best videos I've seen this today. Oh, this this week actually. Apart from all the Popeye stuff, is all popping off. Um, no pun intended. But yeah, that caught my eye. Oh Jesus Christ. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Um, I also got to thinking. You know what? I was thinking. I'm still. I'm still have. I'm still trying to get my mind off this whole Drake getting booed at Frank Ocean. I mean, that's sorry, at Tyler Crater's concert. Um. It's still kind of perplexing me and still kind of leaving me dumbfounded. I know that, um, you know, there is this idea when you're coming up and you're like an underground artist or you're, you know, just, you know, you're on the way up. You're you're doing your shows, you're performing in little holes in the walls, you're performing at restaurants, cafes, places that no one wants to see you. You're just kind of earning your stripes, right? You're earning, you're earning the respect of your audience. So you're trying to, you know, show them that you can do something or you are kind of talented. You know, the, the quintessential Ed Sheeran story, right? You rock up with your guitar, looking away that like Ed Sheeran does to a pub. Everyone's going to think you're that annoying guy in the fucking Weatherspoons who tries to sing a song that no one likes. But then you belt out a couple of hits and everyone's like, oh shit, this guy's actually quite good. So, you know, there's always that kind of hesitation with new acts. But it must be a weird in mind, because I think it's, it's something that you would expect. I think if you're an artist, worth any worth from um, anything right and has some kind of understanding of the scene that you're in you probably would have or industry you and you probably would have lo- read loads of interviews watched loads of interviews consumed all the documentaries listened to all the albums um you know poured on over every kind of like la- all the kind of in notes on an album and who produced it um who mastered it all that sort of stuff right you exactly produced the album you would make sure you are fully immersed and everything that has to do with the industry that you're in or the music genre so that you would have probably heard the common story of like oh labels turned me down i couldn't get a meeting here i couldn't fill this place i didn't sell any tickets my first album didn't sell any units like you know you you've heard those stories and one story you would have probably heard is that you know people receive a negative reception when they go and play at certain places right the ramones got booed off stage um led zeppelin got booed off stage at one time aerosmith have a really funny story about getting booed off stage rolling stones um there's a lot of people that you know some of the legendary bands back in the day who kind of you know 
um, have influenced a whole generation of artists, you know, got booed in the beginning, especially if people didn't understand what they were doing or weren't really familiar with their music. <laughs> Shit happens. Mob mentality exists from a long time ago. But it must be a really weird mindfuck if you're an artist of someone like Drake's level to be at a concert like Camp Ragnar, where in some respects you would, even without saying it, you would kind of, um, even without saying it, you would have this idea of feeling that you're kind of above those people in a certain sort of respect respect right you probably in terms of numbers of streams you probably outdo everybody on that fucking lineup even though streams and numbers don't really matter that much but in terms of just hard evidence as to who has more ears listening to their music you would obviously be able to prove that people like you more than them right even though they could say oh you had the machine behind you and you're this per cool but you could just say hard numbers i am like on paper better than you people on the list of the kind of vlog not right so there's that part of you then there's a part of you that's also like those kids that are performing on those con on that on that lineup especially if you're Drake, because they are kids to you because you're in your 30s, you would say that those kids are probably look up to you, right? They see you as like a big brother, as somebody that really helped him out on tour. Even Drake, I think Drake was the one, right? Didn't he take him Kendrick Lamar and um, Asa Rocky on tour, right? In, during the, in the beginning. Maybe this was maybe after the second album or something of Asa Rocky's. There was something that he played an instrumental role in. Maybe I'm confused, I'm not too sure, but let's just say they all kind of look up to Drake and say, yeah, he's kind of... Um, doing it the right way and, or he's doing something that I would also like to do in the future cool so to get to a place like that and then to suddenly get booed it must be a fucking mindfuck and it? it really must really mess with your head because it doesn't make any sense right because there's no data indicating to you that you're falling off that you don't necessarily have the people on your side anymore nothing points in that direction all your numbers are where they should be you have probably more offers to do brand deals and collaboration than you can probably have time to do them right no not enough hours a day to help out all your friends that need a verse or need assistance or need a bit of a uh, look over on certain things you've got other opportunities outside of music you know coming out of your ass so nothing is showing you that you're probably on your way no no none of those you know, industry indicators are kind of pointing towards the the idea that you could potentially get booed. And to get booed at a place like Camp Vlog, no, a place that you probably didn't even want to be at, that you probably just went there because you wanted to support your friend in Tyler the Creator, is, it must be a mindfuck. But then it got me thinking about mindfucks and it got me thinking about someone that doesn't learn from mindfucks or someone that's incapable of understanding um, why people would have an aversion to his kind of brand of music. It's DJ Khaled. Remember DJ Khaled when he got booed, right? This is the epic video of DJ Khaled getting booed at EDC, right? And this is another example of um, maybe booking the wrong person for the wrong crowd. I think Drake was probably the right person for that crowd at Camp Vlog Noah, but I just think it would have been sorted out completely if they just would have announced who he was. Yeah, sorry, announced that he was coming and it was he was a co-made headliner. Because I think what happened was that at the concert, it seemed looking back on it now, it seemed as if everyone was under the assumption Frank Ocean was going to perform because it had question mark on the fly and no one confirmed it, no one denied it. They let the hype kind of carry the kind of festival forward. They sold that tickets. You know, I understand that game. So when people arrived and they saw Rocky come out, then they saw Uzi, no, Rocky Uzi come out and then Drake come out. And Drake, when he came out, I think specifically said, I'm only going to perform a couple of songs. So people were under the impression, okay, cool. We're going to get Drake for a bit, then Frank Ocean. But to, for anyone that really thought that Frank Ocean was going to come after Drake is insane, right? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and Frank hardly comes to anything. So that kind of was quite funny, right? So probably r right crowd, but just wrong way to kind of roll it out. But this one, the DJ Khaled at EDC, was definitely wrong crowd, definitely wrong artist. DJ Khaled is probably the antithesis of everything an EDC crowd would hate. Even though, in some respects, some of the, some of the, the EDC DJs would probably have to say they probably owe a lot of that boom -bastic, um shouting over the fucking um, track, um, sort of like hands in the air style to someone like a DJ Khaled or from hip hop culture. So maybe that could be a stretch, but the way he kind of rants and raves over tracks, the way he cuts them after 30 seconds, like those annoying hip hop parties I used to go to back in the day at Marketplace, it just was a recipe for disaster. So remember this, this is a clip from YouTube of someone um, recorded of him, they're in a, in a crowd, right? Of him trying to hype up the crowd, but it falling completely flat. So people will boot. So it's, it seems as if, right, this is an odd thing, right, that you don't get usually in um, electronic music concerts. I think for the most part, I think this is something that always made me think. I remember in the beginning when I used to go to kind of Living Proof and those kind of parties, you think, oh, these guys are technically really good DJs. I think this was maybe during the tech house era, maybe. <laughs> and I was hearing a lot of, um, who, who did really good edits at the time? Uh, was it Wolfram? Was it Wolf and Lamb? 
might be Wolf and Lamb. It might have been also um, was it Jacquees? Who's not Jacquees? Not Jacquees. Jack Jack Green, maybe as well, doing a couple of hip hop edits. So at the time, I was going to Live in Proof. Often, I would see a lot of these really technically proficient DJs playing at Live in Proof that were really terrible at playing current modern day contemporary hip hop tracks for the most part. Right? There was a time where those kind of parties were just a, a, again a celebration of like you know um, hip hop from the late probably from the late nineties up, up until two thousand and. 10 or something that was all they seemed to play right the same tracks again and again the same combos it's just you know it just got a bit tired it got a bit stale now maybe I'm, I'm assuming nowadays judging by the lines i've seen online they're embracing a lot more of a younger audience a lot more younger DJs are coming in who i would hope are more adept or more willing to play newer stuff that our kids actually listen to nowadays and obviously with the influx of new and popping uk rap stars there's a plethora of music to choose from right so maybe give them some sort of slight some sort of um um allow them for you know maybe playing you know the best of fucking 2001 hip-hop back in the day but one thing i always maybe wonder is like why don't these technically proficient djs move over to other genres and just take that same sort of like you know the same maybe the same couple of tracks that they play and then maybe make edits of maybe electronic dance music edits of them or maybe tech house edits of them i think that would work really well i never really understood why they wouldn't necessarily branch out but again you know most people don't want to branch out that's a genre that they're really interested in etc 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 but one thing that really I thought would never work if they did decide to make the move over to another genre was this way of mixing where they kind of, you know, you play the first verse or maybe the first hook or maybe the first the, the first the hook before the verse sometimes of a, of a track and then you kind of lock it off just before it gets to the, or just before just before it gets to the chorus or just after the first couple of bars of the chorus you bring the other track into the same thing. So essentially, if you go down the track list of a DJ especially the person that played at Living Proof those kind of parties and they played like a half an hour set, their tracks would be like 30 tracks deep. You'd be like, how the fuck did you get through 30 tracks in 30 minutes? And you realize, oh yeah, it's like a minute or it's like the max time any track is playing is like a minute and 20. And it always used to annoy me because sometimes, you know, I don't know, the best verse was the fucking third one or you just went to listen to the whole track. I don't know. Or some of the track or at least, at least, at least, at least let it get to like the second chorus, but that never used to happen. It used to really annoy me. And I'm, and obviously with the EDC crowd that has, you know, tr usually a lot of EDM DJs tend to play, especially the tracks with vocals, they'll play them all the way through. So I'm not surprised that he got booed and he got kind of got this surprising kind of uh, backlash, especially with the whole shouting over the track and shit. It's just super annoying. So yeah, <laughs> this is really, really funny. He's a terrible hype man's on stage, overweight, uncoordinated, corny, just, ugh. I, I love his interviews, but honestly, man, like, as a, imagine to see someone like this on stage and a performance, of, like, it's just, the only way I want, you know how I want to see DJ Kelly perform? I think if he had the Vegas residency, like, that would be fucking epic. Like, every week a different artist came through and was a special guest or some shit, he kind of, you know, was able to maybe put on... Um, other legendary hip hop artists give them a platform maybe do a night where he goes through the you know maybe it's a night of the history of hip hop where he kind of plays every single classic track that maybe influenced the genre of hip hop or led to it blowing up you know he goes through every fucking decade that would be fucking sick something like that but to see him perform on an EDC stage with his DJ and him on the mic going through this pre rehearsed set and him jumping and wailing his hands in the air and saying hands in the air, hands in the air every 10 seconds. Anyone that says hands in the air every 10 seconds at a concert or, a, or an event, you know the event isn't going well. If you have to constantly try and push and cajole your audience to put their hands in the air and get hype or open that pit up, open that pit up, it's not a, it's not a vibe. It's not a vibe. You're, you're engineering a vibe. You're trying to manufacture the vibe. You're putting a vibe in a petri dish and trying to create a fucking steak. Ah! Working on winner. People like the tracks, they just cut them off really quickly. <laughs> All I want to get to where it gets good. Nothing here makes sense. Where is it? Is it here? Put your hands up! 
Look, he's dancing now on stage at 11. It just didn't go too well. And here we go to the end. What did he say? What did he say? What was the person saying in the crowd? Okay, here we go. The boost starts at 12. <laughs> now he's trying to appeal to the crowd. Also, what's happening now? Still more hand movements and wailing around. Again, it's hard to judge these things really looking back on it actually because you don't know whether or not it's just that certain little section where the guy's recording that isn't really vibing with it. Usually everyone at the front is the hysterical, you know, ultra fans who run to the front and just stand there the whole, you know, the whole night and piss in their pants because they want to just stand there and watch someone's feet as they're performing. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I still wouldn't pay my hard on cash to go see this guy perform. It's not going to happen. Unless, like I said, it was a Vegas residence. I'm getting tired of holding my arm up. I'm getting tired of holding my arm up. This is what I got to tell him. Hold on. Hold on. He can, he, he can hear it as well. He can hear the booze. They cut me off. Yeah, because your time's over. <laughs> that must be such a mindfuck for artists of that level, right? For people to be booing you, like, audibly. Like, you can hear that shit, right? Get God involved in it. That's the easiest way to win. <laughs> a bit of God. No one can boo God. Anyway, I can't, it's too much of this, man. It's fucking so awkward seeing him dance this on stage like that. But again, that's what sometimes you have to kind of be aware. You have to be maybe aware of the crowd you're playing to. Also, maybe invest in a little bit of a stage show, you know. Maybe have some screens, some dance on stage. Do something, man. He just went there, picked up a bag, you know, brought a DJ and that's it. You know, just do a little bit more. I don't know. Do something more with the whole performance. Maybe that would have gone a bit, a bit well with the crowd. But yeah, you know, booing happens to the best of us. Um, I think... Again, it's a, it's an interesting um, conundrum to have it happening to some of the biggest stars. Maybe it's also a reflection of what we're seeing now with, you know, people online ranting and raving about movies when they don't when they're not done well. Especially you know with the fandom menace in terms of the Star Wars fans, how they kind of go at directors and get at them. You know, which is a kind of a new phenomenon too with social media that fans have the ability to say, hey, that movie stinks, redo it, or we're not going to support you. Um, and it's actually worked pretty well recently, isn't it, with the Sonic Hedgehog uh, movie? You seen that? The new trailer come out with that, and that looks fucking cool. They put the Sonic the Hedgehog trailer out, I think, in April of this year, and it was met with fucking, you know, just pure mockery and laughs and just, you know, disappointment because obviously the animation or the whatever the CGI they used was really, really bad. And then they kind of went back to the drawing board, they redesigned the Sonic, they even kind of edit I think they re edited the entire story arc so it kind of comes off a little bit more funny now it's a bit more of a comical edge they put the trailer out the other day and it's got wide it's got so much praise online it was trending up thing for a bit last night everyone's kind of got only good things to say about it and i've also liked what's happening now is that a lot of the, the a lot of the quote-unquote fandom menace youtubers who i kind of follow have really gone out their way to let everybody know that hey we didn't actually win this is more so and uh, this is more so what we want the production companies to do in general right to have an ear open to the fans to listen to some constructive criticism not all criticism because sometimes if you try and appease the fans completely you'll just be stuck in pre-production you know for an entirety you have to kind of maybe some make some executive decisions on what you decide to go creatively or whatever it may be but there are some aspects of especially when it comes to you know really nerdy shit that only a specific group of people were going to watch anyway right and that isn't necessarily going to have the possibility of permeating popular culture. You know, there's not a lot of people who, there's not, you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't think a lot of the general public are going to be running towards the cinema to go watch Sonic the Hedgehog movie. But if you can capture the actual hardcore fans, they will, they won't stop, um, you know, they won't stop preaching or talking about that movie if it's good. They won't stop talking about it. And then in general, that would then pique the interest of the casual fans. Could be like, oh, cool. What are these geeks and nerds? Why are they so interested in this movie? They'll check it out. And then, you know, that's when then it kind of turns into becoming a cult movie after the fact. But you have to just kind of, you know, hone in on your on your market or on your niche, on your kind of target audience. And I like the Fandom Menace YouTube channels have been specific and been saying, look, we didn't actually win. This should be the normal state of affairs. But as a way to kind of reward the production company for actually listening to us, let's go out there and back the movie. Let's go out there and watch it. Let's go and invest all our money and, you know, in the merch and everything else that surrounds it and really show them that, hey, because you listened to us and because you delivered on the promise, we're now going to support you with hard-earned cash for that. Because, you know, most of the time, production companies don't really run by... Uh, that's all surprised they went back and redid the Sonic Hedgehog movie because it's not really 
there's no real um emotion or empathy when it comes to those kind of decisions it's mostly a monetary thing so probably paramount whoever they may be who is producing uh sonic looks at the numbers and said hey if we're having this kind of ne- negative reaction before the movie's released we're probably going to lose a lot of money by the time it gets released right so they want to recoup some of their funds and you know they've got jim carrey and a few people in the movie who you know who i'm sure weren't cheap to book so they want to recover some of the funds so the best way to do it is to kind of go back to the drawing board deliver a better product in the hope that that will then spur the fans to proselytize and to kind of preach about it to their friends and then that will then again you know make them the money that they so love but again for us fans we have to make sure that we kind of reward good behavior in that respect and kind of make sure we go and support it so yeah definitely check out that Sonic the Hedgehog movie if you have a chance it looks it looks fucking awesome um I can't wait to see it when that comes out too um let's move on to some other topics here what else do we have here oh we got what the hell is happening this is a is this a do with Kevin Hart it must be right yeah so um this is from the people's choice awards right happened the other day i don't know i don't know who votes on these kind of things let me pause it here before i start i'm not yeah this is kevin hart at the people's choice awards um i'm not sure who votes for these things i'm not sure how it goes by some it's an e-thing so maybe it's, you have to be a an e-subscriber subscribe to the newsletter they might be sending you a link beforehand but i don't know anyone that actually votes for it doesn't really matter who votes for it probably not e is probably owned by a big multi-corporation brand or something an arm of hollywood who probably use these shows as a way to kind of market their stars as a way to maybe quote unquote reward them um and also to maybe kind of encourage them maybe in a weird way to kind of continue doing the hard work or continue going to auditions i don't know what these kind of serve but also there isn't a big audience of people out there who are completely obsessed with celebrity culture hence why a channel like e exists right so that is essentially you know the home of celebrity news and gossip so those maybe this show is like um a concert maybe yes yeah, a concert for celebrities right so if you're a fan of celebrities you go and watch them stand around talking accepting awards and giving you you know speeches about how you can save the environment whilst they jump on their private plane cool all right but kevin hart gets an award for comedic what, what do you get the award for for comedic comedy actor of um 2019 obviously it's kind of um serendipitous that he decides to no it's serendipitous that just as he's recovering from his really um you know horrible car accident he got into a few months ago is when this kind of you know he rolls out jumanji he does the whole halloween costume jumanji comes out and then we have this award show it's a bit it's a bit um it can leave maybe leave a bad taste in your mouth the way um the way uh celebrities are able to kind of generate content out of just about anything but in some respects you have to respect the game that is what it is um everything is essentially content um you know just a tweet can be content a commentary on something can be content everything can be spun into different types of content even people on youtube do the same sort of thing you take like again i'm probably doing this with, with this, this kind of appearance or his acceptance of this reward you take one bit of content you interpret it one way you deliver it on your platform that's a bit of content another person responds to that and it kind of just you know permeates all over the place so that is you know whatever that that, that is what it is but there's a part of me that's a little bit miffed by this because we we still don't know what actually happened to kevin hart in the car accident we still don't know what led to it we still don't know the circumstances around it we probably will never know because kevin hart's of the level of celebrity where misdemeanors like this misdemeanors such as car accidents or wherever they may be can those stories can get um not sweeped under the rug but some of the details can be left out of the story purposely right due to having you know really influent really powerful and influential managers agents or representatives they can do a good job behind the scenes that's why you basically pay them your dead 10 percent, right so they can ensure when you get into some of these kind of boo-boos that they can be there to kind of you know um uh to make sure that they, they divert attention from other places because it doesn't make any sense still right he was in a car that seats maybe two people and it has a kind of really small back seat i think for the most part um he gets into a car accident. Supposedly, he was in there with three, with two other people, a couple. Um, the couple haven't spoken since the car accident happened. They've now gone ahead and sued, I think, Kevin Hart and the manufacturers of the car. Kevin Hart is now suing the car manufacturer. Um, we don't know how he got into the accident. We don't know if it just skidded off the tracks or if somehow, allegedly, anyone there was inebriated or intoxicated. No one knows anything. So it must be a bit awkward to actually go on stage and accept this award because imagine if we get to a point because you know i still have the feeling that there are members of the press or the media that still have it out for kevin hart that want to see his his empire crumble i think the fact that he you know lost out on hosting the oscars due to them discovering those old tweets 
was unfortunate, but I still don't think it probably satisfied the blood first that some of these guys have. So I think there's probably a side of them that is still probably in the backgrounds, uh, trolling through the records and trying to find some crumb of evidence that paints him in a bad light in this car accident. So if I was Kevin Hart, I would have probably laid a bit more low and just kind of like, you know, put out your little trailer about you recovering from your accident, but maybe don't talk about... <sighs> Maybe don't talk. Maybe just don't. Maybe just don't go and accept awards about you being a comedy genius, and then give a speech about you know thanking the fans because you're recovering, and you know thanking God and shit. I don't know, man. It just brings too much attention. Or am I? Am I? Or am I reading too much into it? I don't know. What do you guys think? Let's play a little bit of the clip now. Been my best performance. I'll definitely get copies up to this. Let's see what he says. Appreciate. Thank you. I haven't actually listened to this yet, so let's see what Major, it thank you to you, Robert. I appreciate you. Love you. Been a fan. Um, first and foremost, man, thank God, because I definitely don't have to be here. <laughs> um, the God, the God, uh, the God trip is, uh, is, the God hustle is like, is in full force this year, isn't it? SPAC Nation, Kanye West, Kevin Hart. Everyone's going full tilt, God in it. Like even DC Young Fly is kind of trying to convert. Remember, did you see that interview with DC Young Fly on No Jumper? It sounded like he was slightly trying to convert. Fucking, he was trying to get um, Adam Twenty Two to become a born again Christian. It's like if ever there was somebody that represented everything that Christians don't want to be, it's Adam Twenty Two. You're just looking at him like, really, dude? Do you really think I'm the best ambassador for this? Maybe he is, isn't it? Maybe if he converts, he can probably lead a whole group of you know, um, uh, I don't know, sex addicts um, to to Christ, but. I don't think so, bro. Don't think so. But yeah, let's let Kevin Hart continue talking here. Yeah? I am. It makes me appreciate life even more. It makes me. That award is weird. It's like an air freshener, isn't it? The things that really matter. <laughs> Family. I want to thank my wife, my kids, uh, <laughs> who really stepped up to the plate for me. I also want to take the time to thank the People's Choice Award just for this. This is amazing. But more importantly, the people, man. You have no idea the effect that you have on us as entertainers. Your energy, your support, it means the world. And I truly want to thank you guys for being there for me in my difficult time. Uh, this is special. They all are. I do not take them for granted. Thank you so much. God bless everybody in this room. Peace. Nah, he's a good guy. You can't really hate on Kevin, man. So, nah, he's, a good, he's a good dude. There might be some nefarious, there might be some nefarious issues around his accident, but who am I to speak about them? Um, you know, he's 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 alive and well, he's kicking. He's one of the few entertainers that we have operating on this kind of fucking high level that he is at the moment. Um, he's a real credit and a real asset to the entertainment industry. Inspiration to all in that regard. I love his interviews. Um, he's very um, wise. He's he's kind of been very much of an open book in terms of mistakes, mistakes he's, he's made in public. He's kind of grown uh, bit by bit. You've kind of seen him kind of, he's never, he's not really repeated anything, has he? He's actually, you know, sometimes with celebrities just kind of have those empty, apologies where they just apologize for somebody because they got caught and necessarily apologize because they mean it he actually looks like he's actually learned from every bit of a mistake and he's been an open book he's kind of addressed head on some of the haters and you know the difficulties he's had with some people in the industry head on and he's kind of dealt with that really well so you know if he's if he gets if he's if there's anyone that deserves a kind of pat on the back at an award ceremony and to get given a non you know an absolutely pointless award is Kevin Hart. Sometimes there's people who are just good people. You know, sometimes in class, when you had those students in your school, in your class who kind of got preferential treatment from the teacher, and some of you guys, even though it kind of annoyed you, you kind of had to sit there quietly and admit yourself, you know what? He deserves preferential treatment. And that guy's a cool dude. Do you know what I mean? We get it, man. We make this teacher's life hell. And this kid's actually always on time. He helps all the other students out sometimes. He fucking cleans up after us and puts the pens and papers away. Do you know what I mean? Those kind of good students. You just you just kind of, you can't really hate on them because they're just good dudes. And outside in the playground, he's not a snitch. He kind of plays around with everybody. Those kind of kids, I think Kevin Hart is probably that kind of version of that kind of guy. It's hard to kind of say anything disparaging against him. So yeah, um, I guess, you know, Speedy recovery, you know that, my friend. Speedy recovery. Anyway, let's move on to that one. What else we got on the list here? Ba, 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 ba. Oh, um, we got this video. This is quite funny. It's on Worlds Like Hip Hop, right? So um, there is this common adage around them fighting that I'm not really a big fan of. Well, no, not common adage. But um, for the most part, the fights you see on Worlds Like Hip Hop are fucking horrible, right? They're usually with people who don't have any right or don't have any shouldn't be fighting right 
But obviously, once a hip hop is full of, especially the dudes, a lot of male posturing, a lot of beating of the chest, a lot of like you know, um, just hoop hoopla, right? A lot of shouting, hooting, and hollering. And usually, most of the fights on what's hip hop tend to end pretty quickly because usually one person's shouting and barking, and the other person's completely calm um, and knows what they can do, right? They they are aware of how to, but they know how to fight, so they're really calm. And they're trying to avoid any kind of conflict. They don't want it to go to that way because they know if you know how to fight, you know that you can inflict more damage on the other person, you know, at will. So sometimes it can be a bit hard to watch these videos. But there's also sometimes we watch the videos where there's one person who knows how to fight quite clearly, another person who doesn't, but it's trying to front like they do. And it's also fun to watch because you know, you just know from the stances, from how they throw a punch. Sometimes if sometimes if they throw a kick. Or they go for a takedown, you know, okay, this guy has studied some kind of self-defense or martial arts or something along those kind of lines. There's no way you're going to, you know, leg kick somebody, um, you know, oblique kick somebody, um, you know, go for a right hook, jab, go for, fake the, you know, fake the right hook and go for a takedown. There's no way you're going to do that if you haven't, you know, practiced something, practice some kind of fighting in your spare time. And this video is an adequate example of it. But what it got me thinking of is like, if I saw anybody jumping around and this bouncing at this from side to side, I'll just run because it's obviously this, a guy obviously doesn't fight. Like there's nothing you can do that's gonna win. The only thing you can do is shoot the guy or stab him, right? If he starts to jump around, it's in a circle. Just run. And this guy looks like he knows what knows what he's doing with himself. So this is a fight on Worldside Hip Hop. It's called. Um, it's actually titled pretty funnily too. It's, pro- it's actually p- titled perfectly. Uh, pick the wrong one. The dude gets dropped from a kick to the head during a street fight. So obviously you can tell straight away who the one is knows how to fight him, right? It's quite easy to tell, can't you tell, right? It's the guy bouncing around on his toes, bang, leg kick. Look, moving around left to right naturally, goes for a Superman punch, misses that one. Switching stance, goes for the knee kick. <laughs> Look, he's still coming. Oh my God, he's bobbing and weaving, bobbing and weaving. Hands nice and low, Look, bobbing and weaving, bang, catches him right there. As he's falling over, boom. <laughs> right, kick to the head. And the guy's completely... <laughs> it's just like... What did he think would happen, though? Did he actually think he was going to win this fight? Like, just run. Get the fuck out of Dodge, man. This guy's bouncing from side to side on the balls of his feet. Bang! Leg kick. Dutch, duck, 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 ducks the punch. Superman punch. Get him, babe. Oh, my Get him God. Get ugly ass. It's just insane. Circles around, circles around, circles around. The guy drops his hand. Move, move, left hand and boom! Right to the side of the face. Comes over, bang on the head. He's out. He's out, man. He's out. He's out. Absolutely out. Starkers. But yeah, a good example of, you know, another illustration of maybe more people should take self defense classes. I think it's so it's interesting. Maybe it's the same thing with politics, isn't it? It's always the people that are maybe the, the least educated or the least well read who are most who are most apt or most willing to kind of, you know, shout from the rafters and kind of let you know what their point of view is on particular, you know political um strategy or whatever it may be i'm not sure what it is it might be the same thing with fighting too why is it the people that can't fight are the ones who are more willing to fight shouting you know pushing people telling people to not hold them back and stuff it's like come on man just relax with the machismo take a deep breath and keep it moving do you know what I mean? no need to do this no need anyway um that's one of them uh next thing i just wanted to talk about here is um this lady sam divine right I'm not sure. Again, I've, I'm, I've just found out about her through videos and stuff online. She's a DJ. I think she's signed to Defected Records. So you already know what kind of music she's going to be playing. Majority kind of tech housey, you know, Elro sort of type of stuff, type of music, stuff that I probably won't necessarily go to as a, as an event. But you know, I'm not I, I'm not um, remiss from you know seeing a couple of clips online or whatever maybe. Um. So there's this image that I've seen actually online. Let me see if I can find it. Actually, where is it? There's a picture here online or a video of her performing. And it kind of got me thinking about the whole outrage with Nina Kravitz and her braids. And it kind of got me thinking about maybe not hypocrisy or maybe just the idea that what I was, what I said previously about Nina Kravitz and the braids controversy is that I think by and large, when people go extra hard at people and try to get them cancelled or try to get them, you know, banished from the scene or society, it usually has more to do with the person that's saying it. Maybe they're a hateful person or they're going through some shit, you know, whatever they may be. And it also has a lot to do with how that person is viewed in the industry. So if you see someone going extra hard at somebody you think is unfair, try and reserve judgment. Don't just jump straight out of the window straight away because usually most of the reason why it's happening is because people in the industry have decided they've had enough, right? 
this person's a shithead. We hate them. They're rude. They're, they, you know, they're not polite and shit. They're up there on us. And, you know, we're going to use any opportunity to kind of, you know, throw stones at them that we can find. Look, you can look no further than the controversy with Amanda Seals, right? Um, she's kind of been pillared all over black Twitter for the most part and some other YouTube commentary channels who have essentially called her out on being a bit of a narcissist, right? Um, thinking that shit doesn't stink, um, you know, going on a breakfast club and saying that people, the reason why she's not like, I think Charlemagne asked her, oh, why do you think people don't like you? She's like, oh, because I'm too smart or because I'm, I'm what some haters think I'm what some haters wish they could be, or some some really weird backwards self congratulatory claptrap, right? So people are calling her out of her shit, and then once you start reading between the lines and you hear some stories of some other of her co-stars, you get the feeling that people actually don't like her as a person. So all the things that she thinks happens to her personally, people not inviting her to parties and she not being invited to certain groups or certain circles, she thinks is an agenda. But the actual reason behind it is because people don't like her as a human being, right? So sometimes you have to think, okay, cool. The outrage in this, or the cancellation outrage or the mom mentality is kind of justified. People don't like you and they're trying to send you a message. So you get the feeling with Nina Kravitz, that's the same thing happening there, right? I'm not sure what's happening behind the scenes, but it seems as if people behind the scenes don't really like her and are using any opportunity to kind of counsel or get her, get her out of dodge. And the reason why it made me, it kind of reaffirmed that theory, because I saw this video of Sam Devine performing, I think at Mixmag or something, and she's got braids on, right? She's wearing, she's got braids on. Um, she has the similar kind of hairstyle that some of these people, some of these work people on Twitter were complaining about. And there's no negative comments, no real, you know, bad things said underneath the video. The ratio on the video is pretty high as well in terms of likes to dislikes. Nothing. I don't see anything happening there. I even went on her Instagram page because she got a picture of her with the braids on, you know, whatever, doing her thing. There's an actual up close video of her also talking to the camera. Like the same sort of thing I think that Nina Kravitz did when she was kind of saying she was going to do a, a performance, you know. The same sort of selfie images that we see of Nina Kravitz and no one's calling her out on it. And Sam Devine is probably more whiter looking wise than, than, than Nina Kravitz, I would say in that regard, right? She obviously looks like she might enjoy her, you know, her rum or whatever it may be, but she's... She's legitly white. There's nothing black about Sam Devine. She looks probably closer to a racial dollar zone than, you know, Nina Kravitz does. But no disparaging comments. Now, I wonder why that is. Is it because she's on defective records and defective records is, you know, is probably the closest thing you're going to get to an urban tech, an urban electronic music label, right? In that, is that kind of cringy to say? I don't know, right? You know, shuffling and, you know, boys in really tight shirts and sunglasses and hurachis and side bags girls wearing really tight spandex and neon clothing you know like you know girls do that kind of professional goth the professional like club kid wear they're like um you know have you ever seen people that go to Grace Mulo in berlin right i think girls that listen to tech house in the uk are kind of like the posh version the sorority version of them the girls that took showers instead they've got like a full face of makeup on they kind of like they kind of put on rave clothes like paint by numbers, isn't it? It's not necessarily a lifestyle. It's just something they put on when they're going to perform. So maybe that's why people don't really give a shit that Sam Devine has braids on, but no one, no one's really complaining. No one's going to care in that regard. And it's not like she wears this all the time. She's got pictures of her in her normal kind of Caucasian hair. No one gives a shit about really long, extra get you know ghetto kind of nails. I don't know. Maybe it's just her look, and everyone knows it. But again, it just makes me think that the outrage around Nina Kravitz was mostly about people just not liking her as a person which you know which is fair but let's just call it what it is but yeah here's her performing and doing her thing she's a, she's a you know, stellar dj you can't take nothing away from her people having fun and dancing and doing their thing but yeah man she's got braids on and you know and a big baggy t-shirt and long nails and i don't know is she maybe appropriating black culture? I don't think so. I don't give a shit. I'm just talking about hypocrisy. Why aren't people making more of a noise about Sam Devine wearing fucking braids, eh? I won't have it. Get on my nerves. But yeah, the set's really good though. Check it out. It's a really good set, as you can hear in the background. I'll link it in the show notes for you guys to just, uh, just check it out. It's cool as well because, you know, most of these audiences and most of these crowds are quite shit. But these people are actually going for it. They're having a good time. They're raving. They're having, a, you know, hands in the air. There's guys here wearing fucking defective merch. So I'm sure they're big defective records fans and big fans of Sam Devine. So big up her and what she's doing. But again, you people on Twitter and fuck that were going after Nina Kravitz. You know what I mean, you guys are hypocrites and shit. You guys aren't really about this life. You're not really keeping the same energy. Maybe because you like Sam Devine, she's probably a nicer person. I don't know. Never met the woman. Never heard her speak. Have no idea. But come on, come on, man. No difference here, no difference. But anyway, check it out, man. Um, 
It's Sam Divine House Set at the Lab NYC, courtesy of Mixed Mag. I'll link in the show notes so you guys check out yourself as well. Anyway, let's move on from that one. Boom, 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 boom. Next thing we got here Summer Walker cancels her shows. Um, How do I approach this conversation without sounding um, insensitive? Let's see here. Uh, how do I approach this? So, you guys are aware of Summer Walker, right? You guys are very aware of her recent album, which I'm still playing now at the moment. Um, let me just cop some please here before I continue talking. Bubbity bubbity bah. Where do I want to cop my please here? Let's go to artists. Let's go down to S, Summer Walker. Uh, yeah, so. Summer Walker's album is obviously out. You guys are all aware of it. I have it here on my phone, so you can see that I'm a fan. I've listened to it a lot of times. Um, over it, I think my favorite song on there might be Tonight, uh, Nobody Else, I Kill You, obviously, with Jenny Aiko. The track with A Boogie, Stretch It Out, or Stretch You Out, sorry, is really cool. It's really good too, sorry. A Boogie's a really underrated um, R&B hip-hop crooner. Um, his guest appearances on tracks are really good. I know some people kind of had the idea that he makes songs for kids, Sometimes his own singles can be a little bit bubblegummy, but when he's on actual, when he's guest appearing on other people's tracks and he has to give the mature swag sex talk, there's no one better than that. He's really fucking good. He's kind of he's very underrated in the same respect like a little Dirk is. Very very underrated. Um, obviously, um, yeah, potential come through. Um, loads of really amazing uh, tracks on here, right? It's I didn't I just remember this. 18 minutes long. 49 minutes so it just comes down under the 50 minute mark which is you know the perfect amount of time for you to kind of listen to an album overall whoops and play that before i get demonetized um really really cool right great album i'm a big fan of it so she decides she did a, a, a she obviously has gained a lot of traction it's gone down as you know it's probably had the same kind of reaction to in terms of r&b fans in the same way that um bryson tiller's debut album trap soul hide right it's really kind of captured everyone's imagination Every, you know girls love the fucking world are using her lyrics as her captions and shit as the captions whatever it may be and then she announced her tour she went all over the place she came to europe for a bit did a couple shows in london and now she's back in the u.s touring again you know it's a standard practice for an artist and i'm sure that the re reception that the album has garnered has also led to more dates being added right i think other dates have been added to the show but then aside from music some walkers obviously spoken quite openly about her issues with social anxiety right her mental health issues her anxiety issues some you know whatever it may be maybe i'm not sure if it's depression where she's got some issues around performing and around being big crowds and obviously you know being a really successful recording artist especially an r&b singer especially an attractive black r&b singer especially in this era um especially with her history as you know um of her past i think she was a stripper back in the day so she's got that presence on stage is able to really command the stage so you know the idea that people are going to go to a performance video um take some clips of her show them online it's just going to there's good there's a lot about her to like and be interested in right very intriguing artist and personality so you look at that and you're like huh um it's kind of all set up for a person to kind of really blow and to become the next big star but then sometimes your own personality and the work that you do can sometimes lead you down a path that you don't actually want to go down and it looks like summer walker is kind of going through that experience at the moment she's kind of you know made some comments and tweets here and there indirectly saying how trash the industry is how fed up she is about you know having to meet people people's standards whether it be fans whether it be industry executives it just wants to just make music and just you know hide away at home and unfortunately it seems as if nowadays with the accessibility of music with the idea that fans can be in touch fans are able to be close to the artists more than they ever have done in the past um artists are also able to contact connect with their fans much quicker um you can produce music on the laptop you know with minimal equipment i think that one of the issues is with all those kind of benefits is that now fans want to want more of you they expect to have more of you they want to see you at a concert they want to see you at a festival they want to meet you at a meet and greet they expect a little bit more i'm not sure it's because of the access because they see you a lot more so they feel as if like they can just bump into you on the street or something but there is a side of it where artists are demanded to do a lot more press a lot more media than they probably have done ever before now also it might have to do with the fact that organic reach i think for the most part organic reach is essentially over um, you have to hope a new platform kind of pops up out of the blue to kind of allow you to maybe reach people organically. Most reach has to be manufactured or bought. 
in some respects. So you're always constantly, if you're an, a publicist, you're always constantly having to put your client in front of the camera in order to kind of garner that attention, to put some eyes and ears on the projects they're doing. So that can obviously, you know, um, become a little bit tiresome. And you hear even with MMA fighters, right? They have to do loads of press junkets, loads of media press days. And, you know, an MMA fight is even, you know, more high stakes than a music career, right? Music careers, look at look at Tinashe, look at look at Tinashe, right? You music career for the most part, unless you're a complete dickhead, you can get an ungodly amount of second chances to, you know, to to come back good again because the the um, the profits that can be made from an artist actually coming back and resurrecting their career far outweigh the millions you might lose in the interim of kind of trying to make it work, right? If Tinashe is able to come back into the scene, get a couple of good writers, link up with some good producers, get her choreography back where it was before, you know, link up with a really influential videographer and just really do an amazing marketing rollout um, in terms of how she announces her comeback onto the scene. You know, she could go on to make the company or the record label millions and millions, hundreds of millions of pounds. Like it can be, you know, because music lasts forever in that respect. So you get it. But, there's also a side of me that's like, it must be hard for a person like Summer Walker who probably obviously doesn't want to be in front of the camera to go through this. And she made a video now recently just kind of explaining that she's essentially going to cancel a few of her shows in the US because she's really struggling with her anxiety problems. And then I'm going to, on the other side, we're going to have another flip opinion that I have of it that may be a bit insensitive, but also something that's kind of been, you know, um, eating away at me as I've been kind of reading these issues that Summer Walker's been going through, um, issues on social media that Cardi B's been going through. And just, you know, there's just a lot of noise happening with these artists that I kind of want to speak about. But let's hear what Summer Walker has to say about the fact she has to cancel some shows. Um, I just want to say that I really, really, really appreciate um, anyone who genuinely loves my music, plays the fuck out of my music, comes to the shows, comes to the meet and greets, um, supports me, and really love and accept and respect my um, my personality. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to finish this tour because it doesn't really coexist with my social anxiety and um, my introverted personality. Um but I, I really hope that people understand and respect that at the end of the day, I'm a person. I have feelings. Um, you know, I get tired. I get sad. Um, and it's just a lot. And so I, I don't want to lose myself for someone else. I, I want to give y'all what I can. Um, so I'm going to keep making music and I'm going to do a few shows, but I can't finish. So she's going to cancel a few of the shows. She announced they're going to be refunding people straight away, right? So there's a part of me that's like, you know, especially if you've watched the Amy Winehouse documentary, you'll know just how um, blood-sucking and callous some of the record executives are, and sometimes even her own family, right? Especially her dad, right? Like an absolute dickhead in the documentary. And essentially, they were all aware that she, essentially, you know, Amy Winehouse was like a ticking time bomb. There's only a matter of fact before, it was only a matter of time before the inevitable happened and unfortunately she passed away. Um, but they were actively still pushing her to perform and go to concerts and go to festivals, even though she was a complete um, shadow of her former self. She lost tons of weight. She looked completely gaunt, horrible. She sounded horrible even when she was on the stage. It just was a complete disaster. And there was no one in the record industry or no one in her label who kind of was taking the executive decision to kind of put her on ice and have her just recuperate, go to rehab, and actually, you know, have rehab, assisted rehab, because I think she ended up dying because she went cold turkey. And is it because she decided to go cold turkey in terms of sobriety, and that essentially had a negative reaction on her? I'm pretty sure something to do with that kind of stuff, right? So no one in the record label was willing to kind of take this decision, um, um, forget the immediate money and the immediate, you know, paycheck and the immediate 10% you'd get for her appearances, and, this, and tell her to go to rehab and kind of really get better. No one did that. So um, even her closest friends and her partner weren't necessarily cognitive of trying to get her to get some help. So when Summer Walker pleads with her fans like this in public and says, hey, I really need to kind of look after myself. I think I'm heading down a bad path. You have to you have to honestly respect it and honor it in that respect. And you have to say, yeah, take your time away from the music and do what you need to do. But there's also a side of me that's like, I think there needs to be an understanding, especially some of the acts coming up nowadays especially when i watch some of the gary v stuff and you see gary v talking to a lot of like up and coming people who want to make an industry there needs to be a conversation there needs to be had with them where they kind of are told um just what to expect 
when they decide to um, get in a get into the music industry. They need to have an understanding of just how hard it is to be a, a professional recording artist, right? Not to be an artist, to be a professional recording artist, a professional musician, right? That needs to be a conversation people have. Because I think nowadays, I think the glitz and glam um, of it and, um, you know, the probably the immediate monetary rewards of it are probably not matching up with the realities of what it means to be a recording artist, whether it's appearances, whether it's writing, whether it's being in a studio, um, whether it's just general label shit. There are stuff you have, there's things that you have to do as an artist that are way outside of the create the creative landscape of sitting down and thinking about themes and ideas that go into an album or sonically or feelings or tones. There's loads of things that are outside of textures that are to do with music that people don't really understand. And I think that is part of the reason that you're seeing a lot of these newer acts that are coming up and now suddenly being thrust up into the limelight and being pushed as a one to look for, you know, because, you know, some Walker's not. She's pretty green in the industry, but she's now being heralded as like the next queen. It's a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of pressure to put on one person's shoulder. But it's also something that I feel a lot of these artists are kind of vying for. They're kind of coming out of the blocks really hot, really strong. They're trying to push for legendary status pretty quickly within their run up or within their come up. Some of them even, some of them have even, some of them even regard themselves as legends in the making, which is you know is crazy to say that. So I think there needs to be an understanding of just what a legendary status means, what it means to kind of try and occupy that space. It means having to do you know tons of shows in Europe, a place that you probably don't want to be, right? Um, away from your family. It means traveling um, in, in middle America and you know doing shows. Um, again and again and again and again in front of people you know um it means putting out more music right that's that's the other thing too you have to understand like the bigger the success that you become the more demand there is for your music or for the stuff that you do which is why you have to respect people like you know the j coles and and you know the kendrick lamars and the you know td as a label even drake in some respect where they're able to kind of dictate when and where they drop music but for the most part the biggest artists out there put out music constantly they're always touring um, they're always putting on a live show. They're always appearing at festivals because, you know, partly because that's where they make most of their money, but also because they want to make sure they're feeding that, they're feeding that beast, right? They're stoking the flames of that fire, making sure their fans don't go somewhere else. But I'd say in some Orca's defense, nowadays fans are a little bit more, um, they're a little bit more crazy. They're a little bit more, there's a little bit more um, standard when it comes to fans. So I think if some Walker effectively took off 18 months, I don't think she'd lose any fans. I think the fans that are with her now would still stick with her. They won't replace her with anybody else. The fact that everyone's, um, you know, going crazy over her album might say that, you know, is it maybe an illustration that she is um, satisfying a need that people didn't think was being satisfied at the moment. And yeah, like she probably has a point. Do you know what I mean? But then again, that that's the issue. There is a part of her as probably as an artist. It's like, you know what? Can I take that time away though? Will I lose ground? Will I lose this momentum? And I don't think you do. And I think there needs to be maybe an understand, maybe um, a decision made when you're making your album or maybe when you're introducing yourself in the industry as a as what kind of artist you're going to be. Maybe it's hard to think about that when you're making a song on Fruity Loops on your fucking bust up computer in your mum's basement. But you need to, maybe you have to be intentional from the very beginning about what kind of artist you want to be. Do you want to go down lane A or lane B? And then every every move that you make, even at the beginning, even at that stage on SoundCloud when you're getting two listens, has to then marry up to that overall goal. Because I think what happens is that you start off as a SoundCloud person and you have this chip on your shoulder that you think you're better than everyone on the charts, right? So you start acting like it. You start believing it. You start manifesting it. You start making EPs and albums and songs that are really well-crafted and have a lot of fucking, you know, time and emotion has gone into them. Um, you don't really have that much of an audience, but you're 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 obviously trying to present yourself as a big act, right? You're tweeting and talking about we, and you have there is no team around you, but you're trying to give the impression you have a team around you. You're trying to give the impression that you had a good show when no one turned up. You're doing loads of like big act sort of stuff so that you give the impression that you're kind of faking it till you make it. So then when somebody decides to believe your your um your narrative and put money behind you and sign you to a record label. And then the real pressure of being a recording artist starts. I don't know if I have that much patience for you now deciding, oh, it's too much. Because you were talking a big game. Now you have to show and prove. I don't mean that to some hooker, but I mean in some artists who do that kind of thing. Like you're, you spoke a big game. You're trying to act like Billy, 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 Billy Big Balls, right? Now you're there. You have to show and prove. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for some hooker for being so open because I think what it does 
is that the next generation of artists coming up or the ones that want to come up who don't necessarily have the exposure or the you know the awareness or you know aren't signed to a label or just want to come up the unsigned can see what she's going through and be like okay cool like what do you like like what do you really who do you really want to be do you want to be snow allegra or do you want to be summer walker like what level of artist do you want to be and sometimes maybe if you sat snow allegra down she might tell you she wants to be as big as beyonce but there might be i she might be doing some action she might be intentionally doing things that are putting her in a category where she can go and and you know and tour for let's say four months of the year and the rest of the time chill in a house somewhere in the middle of scandinavia you know writes for some people walk her dog and shit and relax do you know what I mean like she, that's a, probably a life that you'd want but then if you want the lifestyle where you're attending every big festival every big um you know award ceremony red carpet you're smooching with all the you know with all the high highfalutes in the industry you might have this might be have some basic it might be have to be some give and take in that respect right because once you go to the industry events people are gonna be asking you for features people are gonna be asking you to you know do a track do a soundtrack make a new app make a new ep that's all the industry people are all that pressure comes from there um and you're also going to want to improve you're also going to want to show improve you're also going to want to show out because you're in that space it's a very hard thing to kind of really get your head around but again um what you call it um thoughts with summer walker actually going through this tough stuff i think Again, it, it really reminds me a lot of the Amy Winehouse stuff that she was going through. But I'm just happy nowadays kids are more able to talk about it aloud. And also, you know, maybe the stigma of social media, maybe the stigma of mental health is dying down somewhat. So it allows people to be a bit more open. And maybe as well, the fans are a little bit more understanding and also, under, you know, and are aware that, you know, if their artists are not in the right frame of mind, they're not going to get the best product, they're not going to get the best show. So it's probably advantageous for fans, even though fans can be selfish in nature, to probably allow their favorite artists to take some time away, recuperate, recover, and then come back on the other side, you know, firing for more cylinders. Because then, you know, everyone wins that way. Um, but yeah, really cool message from Sam Walker and hope she gets better over time. Anyway. That's an hour full of podcasting. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, tomorrow's podcast will be more streetwear focused. So if you're willing and able, please listen to that podcast tomorrow. Um, before that, if you want to check out anything to do myself, my blog, my DJ mixes, my DJ gig listings, my photography and stuff that I've done in the past, check out my website, excellentzinger.com. All my listings can be found on there. All my content deals can be found on there too. If you're watching via the YouTube app, why not give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, let me know what you think of the show. If you are listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review. Helps to go a long way for people to find the show. And until tomorrow, my friends, I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care. Be safe. Bye.